So thank you for the generous introduction. Thank you both Spenta and Rajesh for inviting me here. It's really wonderful. I am deeply honored to give these Chandra Sekhar lectures and I'd like to extend my thanks to Infosys for making this possible. I am extremely pleased to see this fantastic interaction between successful high-tech industry and basic research that we see here. I think in the current environment, this is something that should be pursued worldwide. It's good for both sides. And seeing what's going on around here, I have no doubt that this it will be an enormous, enormously productive and will help India as a nation, will help science worldwide, and especially science in India. So it has these three different uh, directions. As was mentioned earlier, last week we had the celebration of 10 years of ICTS. It was enormously exciting. Many people from all, our, from all around the world, very distinguished people came here to salute the success. And I think the founding director and should be proud with his achievement and the new director will have to step up to that level. And the talks I give, I, the talk I gave last week, this one and the remaining talks, every one of these three elements kind of stands alone, but for those people who heard the whole thing or will the rest, there will be kind of a whole direction. So I built it such that every one of them makes sense on its own, but also there's a direction. Uh, last week, I gave my an overview, was a short talk, and I gave an overview of quantum field theory, what it is, where it's heading, and I also speculated about the future. This talk will be less broad, and more focused, but still it will be broader and the level will be slightly higher. And it will be, it will kind of usher the way to the talks I will give in the rest of the week, which will be more technical at the level of the, the level of a school. So the talk, this talk will have three parts. I'll talk about symmetries, this is part one, dualities, part two, and the unity of physics, spite part three, and that's particularly appropriate here at ICTS, where the theme of this place is the unity of physics, putting together people from different disciplines and let them interact with each other. And you will see a demonstration of such the unity of physics that I'll present in this talk. So let me start with the first topic, that of symmetries. And it's not that I put the Taj Mahal here because I give the talk in India. I actually use this slide in many other places, because everybody loves symmetries, not just physicists. And this is a beautiful example of a very elaborate symmetric pattern. This is what makes this structure so beautiful. And physicists in particular like uh, symmetries, and this has had a long history in physics with various aspects of the symmetries that we use. I think the first example that was really important was the old days starting with Galileo, Galilean symmetry, and then the generalization of Lorentz and Poincaré. These are symmetries of space and time. Other aspects of symmetries of space and time are important in the study of crystallography, where in the lattice we have only symmetries for translations and rotation by some discrete amounts. The most sophisticated and more abstract version of a symmetry came at the beginning of the 20th century with global symmetry. This is again a rotation very much like the rotation of space and time studied here. But the new thing here is that the rotation is in an abstract space in some internal space. And the first time you hear about it when you're an undergrad or beginning graduate school, it's kind of very surprising. What do you rotate there? There's no real rotation, but we got used to it. The most sophisticated version of it has dominated physics over the 20th century. And this is the gauge or local symmetry. The first place it appeared is in Maxwell's theory, where instead of using the vector potential A, we can use the vector potential A plus d mu lambda, where lambda is an arbitrary function of space and time. A similar version of it appears in general relativity, where we can start with the metric and shift it by a vector xi, 
which can depend on arbit ar in an arbitrary way on the position x in space and time. Later, it appeared in the standard model of particle physics, in the, say, color SU3, or more generally, SU3 times SU2 times U1, which is the gate group of the standard model. The key point in the local symmetries is that the transformation parameter depends on where we are in space and time. So this is a much bigger symmetry group. We have a parameter x, and for every value of x, we have a separate group, group element that we can transform the symmetry by. You can trans and that was considered deep. When I was in graduate school, this was considered the deepest thing in science. It was the deepest thing in science, first because it's new, it's always thought that the latest thing that came out is very deep, much deeper than anything that was before because it supersedes it. But there were also a more philosophical reason for that. And the philosophical reason was that we should go after symmetries and we should go after larger symmetries and the larger the symmetry, the better. And this is the ultimate larger symmetry because we have a separate symmetry group transformation at every point in space time. What can be deeper than that? This, the second aspect of gauge symmetry is that it makes, it's extremely useful. It makes the presentation of theories like the standard model of particle physics, Lorentz invariant, unitary, and local simultaneously. And that's essential because we want the theory to be causal. And we have heard a little bit about that from Nima Khan Hamid earlier today, and I'm sure this will also figure out uh, later in the week the significance of Lorentz invariance, unitarity, and locality. And gauge symmetry is what enables us to have all that. Also, gauge symmetry has appeared in many different places. I already mentioned Maxwell theory and the standard model of particle physics and general relativity. But it's also extremely important in condensed matter physics. Many condensed matter systems, and I'll give examples soon, exhibit gauge symmetries. And it's also associated with deep mathematics in the study of fiber bundles. Now, this is the hallmark of a deep idea. A deep idea was invented in one place, and it has application in other places that was, it was not originally in, invented for. And so this is why gauge symmetry is so deep. It's big the biggest thing you can imagine. It appears everywhere, and it appears like this is the natural language to discuss modern physics. So when I was your age, this is what I was told. But, and there are lots of buts here. And already in Maxwell's theory, if you go back to the original Maxwell's theory, there's really no reason to use the gauge symmetry. It's possible, but you don't have to you can write Maxwell's theory in terms of the electric and the magnetic fields. And this was actually done later. In quantum mechanics, the vector potential is of course more important and you really have to use the vector potential to describe the theory. And if you use the vector potential, you also need to realize the significance of the gauge symmetry, but this came later. But even in quantum mechanics, Gauge symmetry, in a way, is very peculiar. Gauss law tells us that the Hilbert space is gauge invariant. We're making a gauge transformation, the Hilbert space is invariant under it. I'll add parenthetically, slightly more technical comment, that the Hilbert space is invariant only under small gauge transformations, but the transformations associated with large gauge transformations are central. So it's not really invariant, but it's almost invariant. If you did not understand the last comment, just ignore it. And since the, gate, the Hilbert space in quantum mechanics is really invariant of the gauge symmetries, gauge symmetry is not really a symmetry. It's not a symmetry because it does not act on anything. If the Hilbert space is gauge invariant, then the gauge transformation is one on the Hilbert space, so it doesn't act on anything, and therefore it's not a symmetry. A symmetry is something that relates one thing to something else, but here it doesn't relate anything to anything. Related to that is the fact that all the operators in the theory must be gauge invariant. All the operators that act on the Hilbert space are gauge invariant. So the symmetry doesn't act on the operators in any interesting way. So what is it anyway? A better phrase, it's a gauge redundancy. We introduce additional degrees of freedom that allow us to do various things in a convenient way. We introduce another extra degrees of freedom that allow the theory to be both unitary and Lorentz invariant and therefore causal and local. 
but then we use a symmetry to remove these degrees of freedom that we added in. So it's a better phrase is a gauge redundancy, because it's only a redundancy in our, of our description, but I will be careless and use the standard terminology gauge symmetry, even though it's really imprecise. So let me say more about the fact that the gauge symmetry is not a symmetry. First of all, I've been, over the years, I've been pushing this point for, in talks everywhere, and the reaction was extremely frustrating. Particle physicists gave me a hard time. That was always the case. How could you dare say that, and so forth. Mathematicians and condensed matter physicists, you know, whenever they heard me say this, they said, of course, what are you talking about? It's obvious it's not a gauge symmetry. And indeed, condensed matter people have been using gauge symmetries kind of as a trick to manipulate their Hamiltonians, and they never view that as a fundamental principle of nature. As I said already, and gauge symmetry is manifest, the fact that it's not a symmetry is manifest in lattice constructions of condensed matter physics. Either they introduce the gauge symmetry only in order to make the system look better or simpler, or they have an emergent gauge symmetry that is not there in the fundamental formulation of the theory. This is extremely common in condensed matter physics, and I'll give examples soon. It's also manifestly true in continuum particle physics-like examples in low dimensions, especially in one plus one and in two plus one dimensions, and I'll give examples soon. Um, but there people always said, yes, it's true that it doesn't, gauge symmetry can be emergent, but in two, one plus one or two plus one, we don't really have a photon. So the hallmark of a gauge symmetry is there is a photon which has only two polarizations and not three. It's a massless spin one particle. It has two polarizations. And that's the hallmark of an emergent gauge symmetry. And that does not exist in condensed matter physics or in particle physics until developments that happened in the mid 90s. So in particle physics, and again, going back to the 70s, there was a push to find the bigger symmetry. So one direction was to make it a gauge symmetry so that we have a separate transformation parameter at every point in space time. And the second was to find the larger symmetry group. People were very happy with SU3 times SU2 times U1. And then they looked for a bigger symmetry group, a unification. This was SU5. That's not good enough. So we can have SO10 that is even larger. And there are some advantages to doing that. So it's very beautiful. But people continued further and studied larger groups, E6, SO18, and so on and so forth. And the idea was that we just need to find the absolute larger symmetry group. That would be the symmetry group of the universe. And then this symmetry group is spontaneously broken, and what we see is here at low energies. I think the modern perspective is that this attempt to just make the group bigger and bigger was perhaps misguided. I should emphasize that this does not mean that gauge symmetry is a wrong concept. It does not mean that it's a useless concept. It's extremely powerful, it has many applications, and it's very useful. But we have to learn to live with something that on one hand is extremely powerful, ex extremely beautiful, and so forth, but on the other hand is not fundamental. How should we take, how should we view of that? I think this is a big challenge that we don't yet fully understand. Saying it back diff slightly differently is the notion of emergent symmetries. We can start with a system that does not have a symmetry and end up with a system that has the symmetry, hence the word emergent. The simplest thing that can happen is an emergent global symmetry. We can start from a system that at short distances does not have an exact global symmetries, but at long distances, as we go to longer and longer distances, the symmetry becomes more and more accurate. So these symmetries are approximate in a fundamental way. They might be completely absent at short distances, and they become more and more accurate as we go to lower, lower and lower energies. So familiar examples of that are parity and time reversal symmetries. These are not symmetries of the standard model of particle physics, but they become symmetries when we go to lower energies. So fundamentally, these are not symmetries of the fundamental Lagrangian of nature, but as we go to low energies, we look at the strong force, whenever the weak interaction is not important, 
parity violation is not important. Atomic physics is, is more, more or less uh, invariant under these symmetries. Another example is barrier number symmetry. There are good reasons to believe, and I'll review them soon, that barrier number symmetry is not a true symmetry of nature. But at low energies, it is a very accurate symmetry. And hence, the proton is very long-lived. And if the proton and the neutron are very long-lived, and as a result, or correspondingly, barrier number symmetry is an approximate symmetry at low energies. So the upshot of this slide is that we can have a system that does not have a global symmetry, but at low energies, we have what we call accidental symmetry or an emergent symmetry. So this is the situation with global symmetries. I'd like to contrast that with the situation with gauge symmetries. They can also be emergent, very much like the global symmetries. In other words, we could start with a system at short distances that does not have the symmetry and end up at long distances with a system, with a system that does have that symmetry or redundancy. However, unlike the global symmetry, which becomes an approximate symmetry at long distances, gauge symmetry must be exact. This is really unlike the global symmetry. When a gauge symmetry is emergent, it must be an exact symmetry. And the reason for that is that it's not a symmetry. It's a redundancy, and you cannot have an approximate redundancy. It's either redundant or not. It cannot be approximately redundant. It can be approximate symmetry. A symmetry could be approximate, but the redundancy cannot be. So the slogan to remember, the phrase to remember, is that both global symmetries and gauge symmetries can be emergent. The global symmetries will be approximate in this case, and the gauge symmetries will have to be exact. So the First examples that I will give here, this is a list of first examples, but then I'll have many more examples later in the talk. We can discuss lattice systems. This is mostly in condensed matter physics that have emergent gate symmetry. The fractional quantum Hall effect is an example of a system that has an emergent gate symmetry. And I've already mentioned earlier, these quantum field theories in low dimensions, more technically the CPN model and others. And again, these systems do not have a massless spin one particle reflecting the emergent gate symmetry but they do have that gauge symmetry. So we will soon discuss examples in higher dimensions where the phenomenon is a lot more dramatic. I would like to give another angle on the subject of, of symmetries, and that is in the context of a theory of gravity. So we know we have gravity in the world and we discuss here symmetries. What do we know about the interaction between symmetries and gravity? And the gauge symmetry, we know that gravity is a gauge symmetry. And that's not really a symmetry, so let's put that aside for the moment, but we should discuss global symmetries. So there are very strong arguments saying that, mostly involving black hole physics, that in a system of gravity, it's inconsistent to have an exact global symmetry. You can have an approximate global symmetry, but not exact global symmetry. So there could be such approximate symmetries, and gauge symmetries, on the other hand, are possible. So in the context of theory of gravity, we can have gauge symmetries. In fact, gravity itself is a gauge, a gauge theory, but we cannot have global symmetries because this leads to inconsistencies. However, even when we have a gauge symmetry, there are new principles that have to be followed and that the spectrum should include all excitations that are consistent with the gauge symmetry. So we cannot say we have excitations like electrons only with even charges. All charges should exist. And if the system can accommodate magnetic monopoles, there should exist magnetic monopoles. These are allowed excitations. It might be hard to find them experimentally, but these are allowed excitations of the system. In fact, this fact that all excitations must be present is a corollary of the first statement about global symmetries, but I will not explain here why. So on the next slide, I'm going to summarize Many of the things I said about gauge and global symmetries, so that we remember it on one slide, it's a one slide summary of what we've done so far, and I will also add some more technical comments. So we are going to compare or contrast global symmetries and local symmetries. So the global symmetries are intrinsic. This is an intrinsic property of the field theory. If the field theory does or does not have the global symmetry, this is an intrinsic property of the system. Gauge symmetry is, um, is ambiguous, it can emerge, and we'll discuss soon in a lot more detail duality, which is 
all about the emergence of gauge symmetry. So whether a system does or does not have a gauge symmetry is not a well-posed question, but whether it does or does not have a global symmetry is a well-posed question. Second, we discussed about symmetries emerging in the infrared. Global symmetry can emerge, infrared, i.e. long distances. Ga global symmetry can emerge at long distances, but then it is an approximate symmetry. Gauge symmetry can emerge in the infrared, but then it has to be exact. We use the global symmetry to classify the operators in the theory. That's very important. The global symmetry is intrinsic, and therefore it acts on something, and it arranges the operators in the theory in a representation of the global symmetry. This is to be contrasted with the situation with gauge symmetries, where all the operators are invariant. And as I said before, it's not really a symmetry. A related fact is that the global symmetry can be spontaneously broken. Since it's a symmetry, it can be spontaneously broken. It's a, system of the, it's a symmetry of the system. The operators are in representations of the symmetry, but the Hilbert space is not in a representation of the symmetry. This is the statement that the symmetry can be spontaneously broken. This is to be contrasted with gauge symmetries, which cannot be spontaneously broken. Gauge symmetry cannot be spontaneously broken for the mere fact that it's not a symmetry. If it's not a symmetry, it cannot be a spontaneously broken symmetry. It's often the case that the Higgs mechanism is described as a spontaneously broken gauge symmetry, but this is a valid description in, for, weakly, for weakly interacting theories, but for strongly coupled system, this is extremely misleading, and it's really wrong to think about it this way. The fundamental thing is that a gauge symmetry cannot be broken. And in fact, this is related to the fact that the gauge symmetry is such a big symmetry. The spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs because if you have, say, spins, all the spins point in one direction. And then if you want to move to another vacuum where all the spins point in another direction, you have to affect the system everywhere in space. This is something that is very hard to do because you have to do something very far. The gauge symmetry is such that every spin separately rotates under the gauge symmetry. And the statement that all the spins rotate in one, way, in one direction, if you wish, is gauge equivalent to the spins pointing in another direction, but also you can go and take any one of these spin elements and separately rotate it. It is the statement that the gauge symmetry is so big. It's so big that it cannot, cannot spontaneously break, or more precisely, it's not a symmetry and therefore it cannot break. If it's unbroken, the gauge symmetry, we can class, use it to classify states because the Hilbert space is in a representation of the symmetry. This does not have a counterpart in the other side of this table. And also, it's important to classify phases. So the classification of phases in condensed matter physics, going originally to the work of Landau, is to classify phases based on their symmetries. There's a global symmetry, and the global symmetry is or is not spontaneously broken. This is a way to characterize the phases. More modern developments are more sophisticated, but the Landau classification of phases is essentially that. This cannot be done with gauge symmetries because gauge symmetries cannot break. And a more sophisticated version of that is the issue of a tooth anomalies. I'll say a lot more about it in the coming lectures, but since this is supposed to be colloquium level, I'm not going to mention it. But anomalies, which is very important, uh, behave differently for global symmetries and for local symmetries. Here, there cannot be an, any anomalies. For global symmetries, there can be anomalies. And finally, there is the distinction between global and local symmetries in the context of a theory of gravity. In the theory of gravity, there are no global symmetries, and there can be gauge symmetries, and in fact, they appear essential in formulation of this theory. So this slide is a summary of the first part of the talk, and now I'm going to change gears and move to the second part of the talk and spend a little time talking about duality. And I'll start with very elementary examples of duality. I understand that there are students here and faculty and people at different levels, so some of these things might be too elementary, some of them might be too abstract for some people. And let me do that. So we'll start with simple examples of duality. And the simplest examples are examples in systems that are exactly solvable. And my favorite solvable model is the harmonic oscillator. So the harmonic oscillator in, in quantum mechanics has P and Q, and I don't need to explain the notation. This is the momentum and this is the coordinate. I will not explain the other variables. 
And there are various transformations we can do in the harmonic oscillator that map the Hamiltonian to itself. Classically, these are canonical transformations, transformations that map mix P and Q. So we can do such transformations. And specifically, we can map Q to P and P to minus Q with some coefficients that don't matter. And these transformations keep the Hamiltonian invariant. This is nothing but a canonical transformation. And this is a baby version of a duality transformation. In a quantum theory, this transformation is achieved by performing a Fourier transform. We either use wave functions in the coordinate basis or we use wave functions in the momentum basis. We go from one basis to another using a Fourier transform. And that's what duality is all about. It is important that if we have a wave function which is picked in Q, it is spread out in P. And if we have a wave function which is picked in P, it is picked in Q. I hope I got it straight. This is again something that is similar in duality. We have two descriptions of the system. It's the same system. It's not a symmetry. Duality is not a symmetry. It's the same system and we have two inequivalent descriptions of the same system. And they are characterized by the fact that if the wave functions are very localized in one description, which means that the corresponding variable does not fluctuate rapidly, it's spread out in the dual variable. So if we have a particle in the harmonic oscillator, very, very localized in Q, its momentum is spread out. So in that case, it's better to use the coordinate representation to get a simple physical picture of what's going on. If on the other hand, the particle is spread out in Q and its momentum is localized, it's better to use the momentum representation to represent it. And the fact that small quantum mechanical fluctuations become large quantum mechanical fluctuations will soon be very important. The duality is closely related to the phenomenon of a emergent gauge symmetry. And this is a simple example to see that. Imagine we are in two plus one dimensions and we start with a free scalar field phi. So we can construct the field strength F mu nu is epsilon mu nu rho d rho of phi. And we can describe the system either as one scalar field phi or as a gauge field F for a U1 gauge theory in two plus one dimensions. So in two plus one dimensions, this is something that was under fully understood early on in the 20th century. In two plus one dimension, a single scalar field is dual to Maxwell theory. That's already interesting because we see here many of the phenomena associated with duality. The transformation in terms of the variables f, we can use a vector potential a, and there's a transformation that relates a to phi. In fact, this just comes from this equation, but the transformation is non-local. We can, if we try to write a equals a function L of phi, this is a non-local transformation. Conversely, we could try and write phi as a functional of A. This is, again, a non-local transformation. And in the language of the, of the gauge theory or Maxwell theory, F satisfies two equations. The equations of, these are Maxwell's equations in two plus one dimensions. This is the equation of motion of F and the Bianchi identity of F. And these two equations flip roll under duality. The Bianchi identity is the statement that if F mu nu is d mu a nu minus with the opposite order. It's automatically such that with an epsilon tensor, if we differentiate it, we get zero. This is kind of a triviality because we just have two derivatives and derivatives commute. This triviality in the language of phi is the equation of motion of phi. It's the statement that Laplacian of phi is zero. So the equation of motion is become something trivial in the other side. On the other hand, the other Maxwell's equations of f which is the equation of motion of the vector potential A, becomes a triviality in the language of phi. So this is something, again, that is common in duality. These are two different languages to describe the same thing. One thing is simple in one language. Something else is simple in the other language. Moving up in dimensions to three plus one dimensions, in Maxwell theory, this is something that already Maxwell noticed, that if you take Maxwell's theory and you set the currents to zero, we can exchange E and B. More precisely, we can write, it wherever we see E, we can write B tilde. Wherever we see B, we can write minus E tilde. And the equations go back to themselves. But again, Maxwell's equations change their role under the transformation. What we call the equation of motion and the Bianchi identity flip roles. 
or in more old-fashioned language, there are four Maxwell's equations. Under the transformation, they flip row. Divergence E becomes divergence B, and divergence in curl E becomes curl B. In more relativistic notation, the transformation from the original variables to the dual variables is like that. And again, we see this non-locality that is so important. The vector potential of this is related in a non-local way to the vector potential here. So I've already said that the equations of motion on the two sides in the Bianchi identity flip rules. But this point, I think, is much more significant. The transformation from one side to the other is a non-local transformation. So we cannot write A equals blots in terms of A tilde or the other way around because the transformation between them is non-local. More sophisticated derivation of it uses, again, a Fourier transform, very much like what we had before. But we see here a very vivid example of an emergent gate symmetry because we have two descriptions of Maxwell theory, one in terms of the vector potential of this side and the other in terms of the vector potential on this side. And the gate symmetry of this is nowhere to be seen in the language of these variables, and the gauge symmetry of A tilde is nowhere to be seen in the formulation using the vector potential on this side. So this is an example where we see two gauge symmetries in the system. In any one of the formulations of the system, we use one of them but not the other, and the other is absent completely. So it's clearly not, neither of them seems fundamental because one of, neither exists on both sides of the duality. So in all these examples, duality is achieved by a Fourier transform. And I've already emphasized that the Fourier transform has this property that it exchanges small fluctuations with large fluctuations. So if we have a variable, we have these variables P and Q in the harmonic oscillator, or we have these two vector potentials in Maxwell's theory, small fluctuations in one of them are traded for large fluctuations in the other description. And therefore, we should always pick the description which is more convenient, the one which is more classical, the one which has less fluctuations. And as we change parameters in our system, sometimes one description is better, sometimes the other description is better, but they are not, neither of them is wrong. Both descriptions are correct. Just one of them is more convenient here and the other is more convenient there. So depending on the problem, we have to know which language to use, but both languages are always correct. One of them might be easier to use than the other. Going up at the level of sophistication, we're going to more examples involving interacting theories, theories that are more subtle. All the examples I had so far, the Lagrangian or the Hamiltonian was quadratic. Lagrangian was F square. Or in the harmonic oscillator, we had P square and Q square. And now there we have interacting theories. And here I will just make a list of very simple examples that were known early on. The first is Kramer-Venia duality in the context of condensed matter system. This was found in the Ising model. This is, again, an exact rewriting of the partition function. You start from the Ising model with its spins. You do a set of manipulations, and up comes the Ising model with some dual spins. And the high temperature and the low temperature are being exchanged. There are many examples of that in 1 plus 1 dimensions especially in context of what's known as bosonization, conformal field theory, and other examples. So we start seeing that this thing starts being ubiquitous. So one of the themes of this talk will be that everything I've said so far will turn out to be not an esoteric property of some special examples, but this is the norm. Most quantum field theories satisfy these rules, and I deliberately went through these relatively trivial examples, and now I'm kind of going up to more sophisticated and more elaborate examples. And as in the previous examples, these dualities can be established rigorously. There is an exact change of variables, so there's an exact Fourier transform, exact manipulation of the functional integral or the partition function on a lattice that allows us to go from one side of the duality to the other. And the common thing in all these examples is that we exchange large fluctuations with small fluctuations. I've said it many times because I think this is something that is really absolutely important that we should get, get across. Duality is not that one description is right and the other is wrong. Both are right, except that one of them is sometimes more convenient than the other because of the strength of the fluctuations. And in this case of interacting theories that I'm talking about now, these also correspond to exchanging not just the strength of the fluctuations, but the strength of the coupling constant. 
we exchange strong coupling and weak coupling, we exchange large H-bar and small H-bar. And that has two important consequences. The first is that it allows us to solve models. So imagine we have a system that we understand when the coupling couple constant is small or when H-bar is small. H-bar is small means that the system is semi-classical. So we have a system that is semi-classical. It's very easy to analyze it. We immediately see what it gives us. And then we have a knob and we turn the knob and make the coupling constant stronger. And as the coupling constant gets stronger, the fluctuations are wilder and the system becomes more and more quantum mechanical. And at that point, all our weak coupling approximations break down. But now duality comes to the rescue. If we know a dual description, and I'll soon give examples, they allow us to go to a dual description and find the weakly coupled description of the same system. So the important point here is that this is a, something that allows us to solve systems. We have a complicated system, and by using duality, we can rewrite it as a weakly coupled system that is easy to solve. The other point that is even more important is that in addition to being useful, it also tells us something extremely deep. You notice that this thing exchanges large H-bar with small H-bar. That means that the phenomenon of duality is an intrinsically quantum mechanical phenomenon. It does not have a classical counterpart. So whenever we have a system that is duality is important in it, the system is intrinsically quantum mechanical. It might have a semi-classical limit, but the phenomenon of duality is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. So, and what, so the next point I would say is it's not only as a quantum mechanical phenomenon, it's a ubiquitous quantum mechanical phenomenon. So that's what we learned so far. And now I'd like to give a few more examples of more sophisticated examples. And I'm going to start with three plus one dimensions or dimensions and n equals four supersymmetry. So this is slightly more technical. The details are not important. So if you don't follow them, don't bother. And unlike the previous dualities that I mentioned that can be rigorously demonstrated, I could even do the calculations on the slide. Some of them need a little bit more work, but this is completely correct. There's no question about that. Now we start with speculations, but these are very solid speculations. And so this is a, the first example of a duality that has not been proven rigorously. I should point out that there was a complete cis change in our view of this particular duality that happened in the mid-90s mid due to the work of Ashok Sen until his famous paper, almost nobody believes this duality was true. After his paper, almost everybody believed that the duality is true. So this was a very significant milestone in the understanding of this duality. So this is a scale invariant theory. The theory looks the same at all length scales, and it's characterized by a gauge group G and a coupling constant alpha, very much like the fine structure constant. And the non-trivial statement is that the theory has two, I add parenthetically, there are many more than two, but let's just focus on these two, two different presentations with a gauge group G and coupling constant alpha or with a gauge group G tilde with its own coupling constant, which is one over alpha. So when alpha is small, like alpha of electromagnetism in the real world is one over 137, so this is a good description because it's weakly coupled. In the dual description, alpha is 137. This is not a small coupling constant. It's not a fine structure constant. It's actually a big effect. And therefore, in that respect, duality is not useful there. But on the other hand, if you have a system that is strongly coupled and its alpha is very big, then if we have a dual description which makes alpha very small, it's very useful. So duality exchanges strong and weak coupling and large and small fluctuations. So it exchanges alpha and one over alpha. And the gluons of the new theory, G tilde, with gauge group G tilde, are magnetic monopoles of the theory with gauge group G. So as above, the map between them is non-local. Here it's so non-local that we don't know what it is. I think it will be fundamental, it will be really exciting if somebody could give a rigorous derivation of that. And it's not just because we need the derivation, but because I think that the derivation will give us new insights into how duality works. So to summarize, we have two, two dual descriptions, one with G and alpha and the other with G tilde and one over alpha. And that's an exact equivalence between the two theories. 
like the Fourier transform, but we cannot prove it explicitly. The two, the the two theories that we have are completely equivalent. They have exactly the same spectrum of states, exactly the same spectrum of operators, exactly the same correlation functions, or metrics elements in the quantum mechanical Hilbert space are exactly the same. That leads to some interesting consequences and interesting questions that we can ask. I've already emphasized that the gauge symmetry of the dual description is an emergent one, one that is not present in the original description. So we can ask ourselves, which of the two gauge symmetries is more fundamental? The original one with gauge group G or the emergent one with gauge group G tilde? And since there is complete equivalence between them, we cannot say that both of them are fundamental. The same thing I said before about Maxwell's theory. And the, my take from that is that neither is fundamental. So the gauge symmetry is not a symmetry and it's not fundamental. Another consequence of that is that we have two sets of gluons, and we said that the gluons of one theory are the magnetic monopoles of the other theory. And the duality exchanges the gluons of one system with the magnetic monopoles, which are bound states of the other system. So which set of gluons is elementary? In one description, the elementary degrees of freedom are one set of gluons. In the other description, the elementary degrees of freedom are the other set of gluons. And the lesson from that, I think, is that the notion of an elementary particle is ill-defined. So this whole idea of going to shorter and shorter distances, looking for more and more fundamental degrees of freedom, with larger and larger gauge symmetry, which has been a theme of physics over the 20th century, is really in contradiction with what we see here. This tells us that this is good, it might continue like that for a while, but deeply thinking, that's not what's going on. Deeply thinking, the notion of an elementary particle is in the eyes of the beholder. It's something that depends on which duality frame you're in. What's the gauge group is in the eyes of the beholder. It depends on which duality frame you use, and neither of them is fundamental. There is another notion of duality, which is a slightly different notion of duality, which is different than what we had before in the sense that the previous dualities were all exact dualities. We have two equivalent descriptions, so two inequivalent descriptions of the same physical system. Like in the harmonic oscillator, we could either use the Q or the P representation. There is another notion of duality with two different systems which have the same long distance behavior. In simple cases, this is what is known as universality, two different systems that behave the same at long distances. But in more interesting cases, the degrees of freedom on one and the other are totally unrelated. So the typical thing that we have is we have some Hamiltonian at short distances, for example, some electrons with some interactions, and they are characterized by HUV. This is the short distance Hamiltonian. And then we have an effective Hamiltonian describing the long distance physics at long distances. And it typically uses different degrees of freedom. And what I would really like to underscore here is the fact that the degrees of freedom at long distance are different than the degrees of freedom at short distances. An example that I like to give here is the example of fluid dynamics. The short distance degrees of freedom in fluid dynamics are these degrees of freedom are the positions of the molecules. So we have some fluid and we have lots of molecules and they all bounce around and they satisfy some microscopic equations. And at long distances, we describe the fluid as a field, as a velocity field of the fluid. The degrees of freedom at long distances are follow from the degrees of freedom at short distances, but in a very complicated way. We have far fewer degrees of freedom at long distances, and they are related in a horribly non-complicated way to the short distance degrees of freedom. But it is extremely useful and extremely helpful to use the long distance degrees of freedom. It would be ridiculous to try to study hydrodynamics using the 10 to the 23rd degrees of freedom of the microscopic degrees of freedom. You will not get anywhere. Whereas with the velocity field in Navier-Stokes equations, this is much more helpful. So this is a classical example of such a transformation between microscopic degrees of freedom and macroscopic ones, but there are more subtle ones which I'm going to discuss now. So in many examples, it's easy to identify the degrees of freedom with short distances versus long distances. An example is the ginzburg landau theory of superconductivity, where the ginzburg landau description involves a scalar field, 
which is really a bound state of two electrons. So at short distances, we have electrons and some interactions between them. At long distances, we have a Landau-Ginzburg, Ginzburg-Landau description of the physics using an order parameter, which is like a product of two fundamental electrons. Another example is QCD. At short distances, we have quarks and gluons at short distances. And at long distances, we have pions. These are the degrees of freedom at long distances. And again, we can think of the pions as being bound states of each pion is a bound state of two quarks. So the fact that there is such a long distance description is highly non-trivial, but the degrees of freedom at long distance are not that surprising. It's hard, it would have been hard to guess that out of electrons, you should think of a, a, an order parameter or a scalar field, which is a product of two electrons, or instead of starting with gluons and quarks, you should end up with some theory that describes pions, which are a product of two quarks. That would have been hard to guess, but the fact that such a thing exists is completely natural. In more interesting examples, the map from short distance to long distance is far less, is uh, less trivial. In fact, even in the example of hydrodynamics I gave before, the map from the microscopic degrees of freedom to the macroscopic degrees of freedom is very, very subtle. And examples that we will see, and I'll discuss some of them soon, are first of all the example that we have seen already of an emergent gate symmetry. But there are examples of particle vortex duality in two plus one dimensions, and an example of an emergent gauge symmetry in the fractional quantum Hall effect. So in the fractional quantum Hall effect, we put some electrons, put it in a magnetic field, there are some interactions between the electrons, there are some ions in the lattice, and this and that. And what you have at long distances is an emergent U1 gauge system. And that gauge field, this photon at long distances, is related in a complicated way to the short distance degrees of freedom the underlying electrons. So moving to interacting gauge theories, let me first review what we know about translating to long distance to, sh to short distance to long distances, and then take some lessons from that. At short distances, we have some gauge group G, and depending on the details, we can end up at long distances with different phenomena. So at short distances, we have some gauge group G and maybe some quarks in the representation of G. And at long distances, we can end up with various different things. We can have the phenomenon on infrared freedom. In that case, we, what we add at long distances is the same gauge group G and the same quarks. An example of that is QED. We formulate QED, it has electrons and photon. And at long distances, we have the same photons and electron. In fact, the interaction between them becomes weaker and weaker as we go to longer and longer distances. The second most sophisticated thing that can happen is that we have a non-trivial fixed point, an interacting scale invariant theory. And in this case, the notion of a particle is even ill-defined. Some people refer to it as unparticles. And we can also have an approximately free theory of bound states, and the example of pions in QCD is an example of that. And another thing that we can have is an empty theory, known technically as having a gap, perhaps a topological order. And all these phenomena, all these options, are realized in theories like SUN gauge theories with quarks. This is a menu of possibilities, and it's quite rich. And depending on what the gauge group is, and depending on how many quarks we have, and in what representations we put the quarks, we can get any one of these options. Some of them are realized in nature in the theory of the strong force, and others might not, or might appear in another case. If we make the theory supersymmetric, we can actually analyze it in more detail. And the phenomenon that we see here is that there's a new kind of a, a, a manifestation of this duality that I've already mentioned, is that we have two different theories at short distances that flow to the same theory at long distances. So we have a theory that I'll call electric theory with gauge group G, and a magnetic theory with gauge group G tilde, very much like G and G tilde that we had earlier in the talk, and they both flow to the same non-trivial fixed point at long distances. A more interesting possibility is that the electric theory appears at short distances, and the magnetic theory appears at long distances. This is much more interesting because the theory at long distances is a free theory, or almost free theory. In that case, we see that at short distances, we see a theory that is weakly coupled at short distances. It becomes strongly coupled, so as we go down to lower and lower energies, the coupling becomes stronger and stronger. It becomes so strong that it's no longer useful. But at long distances, we have a new theory, which is 
essentially free. This is where duality is of this kind of different theories with the same infrared behavior is the more interesting because in this case, one theory is the question and this theory is the answer. That's how we do physics usually. We formulate the question at short distances and the answer is what the three system does at long distances. So at short distances, we have an asymptotically free theory based on the gauge group G. And at long distances, we have an almost free theory based on the gauge group G tilde. And unlike QCD, which has at long distances pions, here what we have at long distances is a new QCD-like theory, which I'll call QCD tilde. And it has its own quarks and its own gluons, and they are all composite. So all the quarks and the gluons that we see at long distances are composites of the microscopic quarks and gluons of the original theory. And I would really like to emphasize that they are not elementary. So an observer looking at long distances would say, ah, these are the elementary degrees of freedom. At short distances, the observer would say, no, the, theory, the variables of G are the fundamental degrees of freedom. And also the gauge symmetry is an emergent gauge symmetry that does not appear at all in the short distance description. So this is again an example where we see an emergent gauge symmetry. The gauge symmetry at long distances is not fundamental. And we also see how duality helps us solve the system. And there are many more examples. There's huge catalog of examples exhibiting more or less the same thing. So this appears to be a ubiquitous phenomenon. This brings me to the third part of the talk, talking about other dualities in the unity of physics. So first I'll make a list of some known dualities of different kinds that people have discussed. They are very important, but I'm not going to elaborate on them. So, so far we have discussed dualities between two different quantum field theories, but there are also dualities between different string theories coming under the name TS and U dualities. And there are also string field dualities, dualities between field theory and string theory. And there are various kinds of them. The most recent and the most exciting one is the ADS-CFT or its generalization gauge gravity duality. Every one of these is a topic for a separate seminar, so I'm not going to discuss it here in detail except mentioning it for completeness. I would like to emphasize now, going back to dualities in field theories, and show a few more phenomena and draw lessons from them. So in, there are known examples of boson fermion dualities in one plus one dimensions. And that comes at the name of bosonization. That was understood in the 60s and 70s, notion of bosonization. And in two, one plus one dimensions, a system of fermions can be written in terms of a system of bosons and vice versa. Perhaps it's not that surprising because if we are in one plus one dimensions, there is no notion of spin. So if there's no notion of spin, we shouldn't be surprised that the boson becomes a fermion and a fermion becomes a boson. In two plus one dimensions, the situation is a little bit more interesting. And that's again something that was understood in the 70s and 80s, and then even more so in the 90s, in the context of the fractional quantum Hall effect. People describe the phenomenon of statistical transmutation or the phenomenon of flux attachment. This is a case where you take a massive particle and you change variables on it. And the massive particle that started its life as a boson becomes a fermion. Or you can change variables again and it becomes a boson prime. Or you can change variables again and it becomes a fermion prime. So we have boson fermion dualities, boson boson dualities, and fermion fermion dualities. But the important thing in all this is this is done with massive particles, first quantized massive particles, not massless second quantized particles. This changed recently. So this is something that was fully understood decades ago. But this changed recently, and just to give an overview of all these dualities, the first of them is actually quite old, that's from the 70s. It's a boson-boson duality. This was discovered by Peskin and as Gupta and Halprin. I think Peskin was first. And this is known as particle vortex duality. It's a very two plus one dimensional phenomenon where we have a system of bosons, which is the same as a system of bosons coupled to a gauge field. So if you think that the system of bosons is fundamental, you can say that the gauge symmetry of the boson coupled to a gauge field, that gauge symmetry is emergent. Or you could say it the other way around. 
Much, so this, this is decades ago. In the last few years, through a very interesting source, a set of developments, which is also interesting from a sociological point of view, I'll mention that soon, new boson fermion dualities were discovered. Lots of people contributed to it. One of the most crucial steps was done here in India. I don't know if it was done in ICTS or in uh, uh, Mumbai, but it was definitely done here. This is the first time that this duality was stated, although the precise version of the duality was first stated in Aharoni's paper. These papers are about a large N. And then that duality was made more precise in subsequent papers. So this is a duality between bosons and fermions. And there is a version of it, which is fermion-fermion duality, which actually started in the condensed matter literature by Son, was made more precise later and extended in various directions here. So the new element, unlike the previous one, is with that not, we are not talking about the first quantized particle, massive particle, but instead we're talking about second quantized massless interacting particles. This is a fundamental distinction. And these dualities cannot be proven. And if duality, we started with dualities that were rigorously proven, elementary, then we had ele non-elementary, but can be rigorously proven. Then speculations with a lot of evidence. This is speculation with less evidence. But I still think that they are correct. So there are many examples of interacting theories with massless matter coupled to gauge fields. So we have boson-boson or fermion-fermion or boson-fermion or fermion-bosons or combinations of bosons-fermions. And they come into the same kinds that I discussed earlier. Option one, these are two distinct systems which are non-locally related to each other. So the degrees of freedom here and the degrees of freedom here are related in a non-local way and they flow at long distances to the same non-trivial fixed point. So this is the first thing that can happen. And that's actually interesting because people are interested in various two plus one dimensional field theories and you can ask what's their long distance behavior and there's a catalog of possible fixed points that we know about. It's nice to know which gauge theory that we can write down, which Lagrangian we can write down, flows to which fixed point at long distances. A more interesting thing happens if we start at short distances with bosons and fermions, bosons or fermions or both, and we end up at long distances with free fermions. This is much more dramatic. Notice the similarity to the examples in four dimensions that I mentioned earlier. Here we have an interacting theory at short distances and the free fermions at long distances. That means that this is again, this is the question, this is the answer. The question is very complicated. We have some interacting system with bosons and fermions and gauge fields and the interaction becomes strong and at long distances, this becomes a free field theory. The motivation for the, all these developments in the, of the last few years, I view that as really a fascinating example of how physics works and it really fits the theme of ICTS because this was convergence of ideas from different branches of physics. And one of the reasons we like that and we think this is right is that different communities of physicists came up with closely related conjectures motivated by totally, totally different line of reasoning. So none of them is completely rigorous, but the fact that they end up with the same statement strongly suggests that the statement is right. So first example, first statement is that there are these well-established particle vortex dualities that from the 70s, there's no doubt that they are right. There's a huge amount of Data, some of them can be rigorously proven, and the rest can be numerically proven. There are also various dualities in the supersymmetric world, and these dualities can be deformed. And they are, first of all, they're subjected to many tests, and they can be deformed to these new dualities. These dualities are also related to dualities in string theory, which are motivated by totally different line of reasoning. An interesting direction, which is the direction that was pursued here in India, is to start from ADS CFT and large N. And there it was noticed that the same bulk theory in three plus one dimensions has two different dual descriptions on the boundary in two plus one dimensions. So the fact that the same bulk has two different dual description can make sense only if the two dual descriptions throw away the bulk, the two dual descriptions should better be the same. And they motivated that conjecture. And once you have that conjecture at large n, you can do a lot of large n computations and check the conjectures. And thirdly, 
there were some suggestions in the condensed matter literature that point in similar directions. So this was a motivation. What are the checks? What can we test to check these dualities? First of all, we can use these dualities and derive well-established ones. So we can take any one of these, many of these dualities and perform legal manipulations and land on our feet, derive known dualities, for example, the particle vortex duality or others that I also mentioned. There are also relations to other conjectured dualities, which were subjected to many tests, like the supersymmetric ones. There's also interesting and deep connection to mathematics. Dualities in general are related to mirror symmetry in one plus one dimensions and to level rank duality in one plus one and in two plus one dimensions. So these dualities are rigorous and we cannot start with these and derive those that we are interested in. But the fact that we can start with those that we are interested in and derive these is a very powerful consistency check because we could, it could have happened that we would not land on our feet. Also, this whole set of dualities are not independent. You can assume some of them and derive others. Now, the string theorists among us are quite familiar with this feeling of a web of dualities. We have lots of conjectures dual, conjectured dualities in string theory. It's a huge web of dualities. You cannot prove any of them, but assuming number one, you can derive three, four, and 17. Assuming 10, you can derive 11 and 12, et cetera, et cetera. That means that the whole structure will either stand together or collapse together. And as more and more of these tests are performed, we have more confidence that these dualities are right. And this whole thing has many applications, especially in condensed matter physics. First, in the fractional quantum Hall effect, also in the lambda, uh, this level, in the presence of magnetic field, the first lambda level at half filling and other fra filling fractions. It's also very important in the study of gapped phases of topological insulators or topological superconductors. And this, it's been so powerful so far, it's reasonable to assume that there will be additional uh, such applications. As I'm approaching the end, I would like to make an important point about the very surprising and deep similarity between quantum gravity and condensed matter physics. So these are really two distinct fields. The reasoning is different, the logic is different, the goals are different, but the role of symmetries in these two different disciplines is actually surprisingly similar. In both cases, we have no exact global symmetries for different reasons. In quantum gravity, we don't have global symmetries, as I said before, because in quantum gravity, global symmetries are in contradiction with the physics of black holes. In condensed matter physics, we start with some system at short distances. These are some electrons. They don't have any global symmetry. They might have some translation symmetry of the lattice and so forth, but you're not going to get an E6 global symmetry. It's, it's not a symmetry of the system. At long distances, this might appear as an emergent symmetry, but in that case, it is an approximate symmetry, very much like in the context of gravity. In both cases, we can have emergent gauge symmetry, both in condensed matter physics and in uh, gravity. And again, in both cases, all the allowed excitations must be present. So both in, in, in quantum gravity, this follows from the physics of black holes. If you have an emergent U1 gauge symmetry, all possible charges should be present. In condensed matter physics, the same is true. It's often the case that you have an emergent gauge symmetry, and then there ought to be quasi-particles which carry all possible allowed charges in the system. Again, the reasons are different, but the qualitative picture is the same, and, that I, <clears throat> and I certainly view that as a sign of the unity of physics. Different people, different goals, and the role of symmetry is so similar in both and for totally different reasons. So in conclusion, symmetry is uncommon in physics, both in theory of gravity and in condensed matter physics, we have no exact global symmetries and exact gauge symmetries can be emergent. And I emphasize again that I use the word gauge symmetry here in a somewhat imprecise way because it's not really a symmetry and all charges must be present. The second part of the talk was about dualities. I've demonstrated how dualities are common in physics. They appear in many places. They give us two different descriptions 
of the same physics. It's useful in the sense that it tells us what the long distance behavior could be or giving us a weakly coupled description of a strongly coupled system. But it's also telling us something very deep about the structure of quantum field theory and perhaps even quantum gravity. I also talked about the third part of the talk was the unity of physics. I showed how I demonstrated how over the last few years insights from logically independent lines of investigation converged on the same ideas. Things that started from condensed matter systems on one side, things that started with the supersymmetric dualities on the other side, and strings propagating in anti de Sitter space on the third side, and all three converged on the same set of dualities. And that has led to better understanding of, new phenom of known phenomena and uncovering new phenomena and mechanisms. And one lesson from all that is that gauge symmetry is not fundamental. I said it earlier in the talk, but this phenomenon of duality drives the message home. It hits you in the face that you start with a system that does not have a gauge symmetry or has a different gauge symmetry, and you end up with a description that has a, fundam that has a distinct gauge symmetry. So that tells us that gauge symmetry is not a fundamental description. It's not a fundamental notion in the physics. As I said, it's often convenient, but it could not be, it might be that this is not the only uh, description. I emphasized that early uh, yet last week that I view all that as indications that quantum field theory needs to be reformulated. It needs to be reformulated because it will make it needs to be reformulated to make duality manifest. There's a theme in physics that whenever you are surprised by something, there's a new phenomenon and you're surprised by it, it means that you don't understand it. Once you understand the phenomenon, you're not surprised by it. The fact that we are surprised by all these dualities really indicates that we don't understand it. And if we don't understand it, it means that we're missing something very big. I think there's no dispute about that. And my hunch is that that means that we should really reformulate quantum field theory. I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Wonderful, Nati. I, I, I'm just amazed at how much he has covered within, and then he was on time as well. I mean, it's, it's remarkable that uh, taking, going from sort of the very basic things to the current frontiers, you won't mind taking a few questions, will you? Uh, Pleasure. So, uh, so please, questions. There's some question there. Uh, it's there on the top. Uh, maybe I missed a part of your talk. Could you explain again why black hole? Forbidden global symmetry, exact global symmetry? Uh, you did not miss it because I did not explain it. The argument is actually quite simple. You have a black hole, and imagine you take, imagine barrier number is an exact symmetry. So you throw protons into the black hole, throw ordinary, ordinary atoms fall into the black hole, it gets bigger, and its barrier number grows. Then it emits Hawking radiation. Hawking radiation is completely thermal, carries no barrier number. Some photons come out, and the black hole loses its energy. So we can keep pumping baryons into it, and it will just emit photons. So where did all the baryon number go? The only way it would make sense is if baryon number is not an exact symmetry, and there are processes that allow baryon number to disappear. I gave you a simplified version of it. There are more and more sophisticated versions of it, but it's essentially the same. The argument that all charges must be present are cousins of what I've just said. Thanks. I, I was wondering whether uh, you want to, uh, you made the speculation at the end, uh, not speculation, you made the observation at the end that uh, uh, both in uh, quantum gravity and in uh, condensed matter physics, the, all the uh, excitations from these emergent gauge symmetries are typically present, but for sort of totally, apparently totally different uh, reasons. Uh, uh, so uh, do you think, uh, is, is that uh, just an apparent difference, or do you feel that there is somehow an underlying reason which, is, which leads to this? Uh... 
Well, it's a fact. Yes, so you, uh, so you observe it's a fact. that, but... Uh... I usually, if all my years of research, I always feel that every fact is a clue. Some clues are misleading. Nobody told us that the puzzle would be easy. It's like a jigsaw puzzle, which also has puzzles of, of another, from another box that is there to confuse you. Maybe this is one of these, but it is a fact. Something that... But it's quite a striking... It is a striking coincidence, yeah. I don't know what... Uh, I don't know what to make of it. It might be a triviality. It might be something that tries to throw us in the wrong direction. It might be a clue for something. But it is quite striking that the role of symmetries in these two distinct disciplines is so similar. Uh, yeah. So I had a question about... Uh, yeah. okay. So I had a question, you're, you're talking about the emergence of uh, uh, global symmetries on long distance uh, and uh, reduction of the degrees of freedom. And you gave the, especially the example of fluid dynamics. So do you mean... Uh, example of what? Fluid dynamics. Yes. So do you mean, uh, so as, as I understand in the fluid dynamics also, we don't have any theoretical derivation of the reduction of the degrees of freedom. So do you mean, and empirically we know that. It, uh, it's what? Empirically, like uh, we know that yes. we can describe the system with less degrees of freedom. So what kind of like, do you, would you like to rely on the mathematical derivation or? So in, in fluid dynamics, we don't have a rigorous rewriting from one to the other. Yes. But with very mild assumptions, you can show that fluid dynamics should emerge. You basically say, you have lots of degrees of freedom, it becomes smooth. We try to approximate by something smooth. There are some conservation laws that need to be implemented. We write the conservation law, a Navier-Stokes equation pop out. And there could be corrections, which are high derivative corrections. So you have a systematic expansion. This is very similar to what we have here, except that it's all quantum mechanical. That's the first difference. And the macroscopic degrees of freedom are much harder to guess. But the fact that there is such a derivative expansion in the macroscopic degrees of freedom, this is exactly the same. So there should be the hierarchy of uh, this reduction of degrees of freedom from a scale to scale to scale. Yep. Okay. And this, this, is a, this has been a theme in physics. Uh, yeah. it, comes under, it's the, uh, it comes under the name of reductionism. Normally, people start from the physics at long distances and try to figure out what happens at short distances, thinking that what appears at short distances is more fundamental. And this has been a theme over the last several centuries, the going in re this reductionism. But it also goes the other way. If you know what's going on at short distances, and most physics is not that. Very relatively speaking, few physicists try to go to shorter distances and understand the more fundamental physics. But what most physicists do is the other way around. They take known physics and try to predict what the long, long distance behavior would be. Uh, this is starting from molecules of water and predict fluid dynamics and then analyze fluid dynamics. This is, yeah. And both are important. Just to follow up, like one comment. So, so the empirical versus mathematical derivation of these things is kind of uh, like, yeah, just, just one thought. Okay. The, for this particular example, I'm actually not familiar with the history of the subject. I'm sure that people here will know you. more. I guess Lan, uh, when you said empirical, empirical of Navier Stokes um, uh, sort yeah. of wrote it down as some kind of rough. Uh, yeah. But then I guess in Landau and so on, probably Landau yeah. and Lifshitz uh, maybe it was where it was probably put on a more at least a, a modern um, way of understanding. And a group in India during the last few years, led by Shiraz Minwala, put it on a much deeper level. Okay. I think the equations were written down by Navier, but uh, they were put on a very firm footing by Stokes many decades later. Anyway, the, the, this uh, example you gave about baryon number non-conservation in the presence of black holes, I mean, ultimately, we know that uh, the, I mean, let's assume that the full theory really uh, is unitary and, uh, uh, you know, all the information that uh, comes out as Hawking radiation has correlations uh, so that uh, I can recover the state of the black hole. Uh, 
If so, then then still is this a good way of saying that the baryon number will, is not conserved? Can I not recover the baryon number? Well, I think nobody would argue that baryon number is an exact symmetry. No, no. I, it would have been much nicer if there would have been an experiment, bary, proton decay experiment would give us a number. But it will not change much this story. Then we'll be able, the only difference is that we have to say we'll have a number. I don't know, 10 to the 35 years, 10 to the 37 years, whatever the number is. Okay, that would be wonderful. It would make our, will make us feel better. But as far as what we know now, everybody believes barrier number is not a good symmetry. No, I, there are I various arguments it's not a good symmetry. Connection to gravity is one of them. A matter antimatter in the universe is another. And adding the numbers, the lifetime would be very nice. It will really prove it beyond doubt, but I don't think it would change anybody's research direction. Any other questions? Um, this uh, reformulation of uh, quantum mechanics such that it uh, reflects duality is better. Is that the same as uh, getting a good description of intermediate coupling theories? It's part of the same story, part of the same story, but uh, I can stand here and speculate. Speculations are always free because as long as I say it's speculation, if it, if it works, I'll get the credit. If it doesn't work, I didn't commit to it. But there's really no point in uh, speculating more. I think this, this is not a research direction. For a graduate student, I would not give that as a problem. This is something that I think we should keep in the back of our mind. It's kind of a long-term goal. And it's good for colloquia. It might even be good as a comment in a seminar. But this will change if somebody will have such a, when somebody does have such a reformulation, then this will be a reason for seminars and colloquia. But my hunch is that this is not easy. And even when it is achieved, it will come from developments that are not analytic continuation of developments that exist today. There will be some development from left field that would come in and, and inject new ideas. So I'd be reluctant to speculate. So a few days ago, I stood here and said the same thing. And your role of asking me more about that was played by David Gross. So you should feel good. He was sitting here asking me, can you say more about it? <laughs> and I dismissed him almost the same way I dismissed you. 